Royal Air Force machines flew over northern and western Germany last night and dropped more than six million leaflets addressed to the German people. The Ministry of Information says that they carried out extensive reconnaissance flights and that they were not engaged by any hostile aircraft. British warships are now active on all seas, but the Admiralty says that there have been no major operations yet. The first war communique from France was issued this afternoon, and it said that operations had begun by all the forces on land, sea and air. No further details have been received. It is not yet known how many lives were lost when the British liner Athenia was torpedoed today without warning in the Atlantic. The Athenia was bound for Montreal from Glasgow with 1,400 passengers. All except those killed by the explosion took to the boats and were picked up by various ships. 430 survivors are reported to be on their way to Galway in the Norwegian steamer Knut Nelson. They are due to arrive tomorrow. It is officially stated in London that this attack, without warning, was in deliberate disregard of the declaration made voluntarily by Germany when she signed the London Naval Treaty in 1930. Germany then renounced of her own free will the right to make use of unrestricted submarine warfare in any future campaign. The rules which Germany then undertook to observe clearly lay down that no merchant ship may be sunk without warning or until the safety of all passengers and crew has been assured. Ships' boats are not to be considered in a place of safety unless they are within half an hour's rowing distance of land under favorable conditions. The Athena was torpedoed 200 miles from land. It has been officially denied in Berlin that a German submarine was responsible for the torpedoing of the Athenia, and it is suggested that she was mined. But the British Admiralty point out that there are no British mines in the area in which the Athenia was sunk. The Athenia's passengers included 311 Americans, many Canadians, and 30 emigrants from Poland and Czechoslovakia. The news of her sinking has made a deep impression in the United States where the White House was immediately informed. President Roosevelt's secretary, Mr. Stephen Early, has emphasized that the Athenia was outward bound, taking Americans and Canadians away from, those, from the war zone. Mr. Early pointed out that this showed there was no possibility that the ship was carrying any munitions or war materials. A statement on the sinking of the Athenia was made in the House of Commons this afternoon by Mr. Winston Churchill, who was warmly cheered on his reappearance in the House as First Lord of the Admiralty. After reporting the facts we have given, Mr. Churchill said, It is certain the Athenia was torpedoed without the slightest warning in circumstances which the whole of the nations of the world at the end of the last war, including Germany, stigmatized as inhumane. The First Lord stated that the Athenia was in no way equipped as an auxiliary cruiser, he also assured the House that the convoy system was being brought into operation with the utmost speed. On one route, it had started immediately after the declaration of war. The first report of ships being mined has been received from Copenhagen. The Greek merchantman, Kosti, on her way to Antwerp from Leningrad, has been sunk. There are no casualties. The other presumed victim of a mine is an unknown Danish cutter which was blown up some distance west of the VYL Veal lightship. A news bulletin in English from the German broadcasting station Ziesen this morning reported that mines had been laid over an area of the North Sea lying east of the Dogger Bank and north of the Netherlands coast, and that ships were warned not to navigate in this area. A 
An official communique was issued in Rome tonight about Signor Mussolini's effort to arrange a five-power conference at the end of last week. It says that Signor Mussolini's suggestion was made on Thursday and that France and Britain replied on Friday. By then, Germany had started military operations against Poland. Early on Saturday morning, Signor Mussolini informed Herr Hitler that there was still a possibility of calling a conference, preceded by an armistice. Herr Hitler, who by that time had received the British and French messages asking for the suspension of operations in Poland, replied that he did not reject the plea of a conference out of hand. But he said he wished to know beforehand whether the British and French notes constituted an ultimatum. If they did, he said, all negotiation would be useless. He also asked for a delay of 24 hours before giving his decision. Signor Mussolini passed on Herr Hitler's reply to Great Britain and France, and late on Saturday afternoon, according to the Rome communique, they gave affirmative replies to Herr Hitler's questions. But they said at the same time that they would not take part in a conference unless German forces were withdrawn from Poland. The Rome communique ends with the statement that the Italian government informed Herr Hitler of these conditions and added that if it did not hear to the contrary, it would assume that Herr Hitler could not withdraw his forces. His Majesty the King today sent a telegram to the President of the French Republic in which he said, At this moment, in the destiny of our two peoples, when they are once more standing shoulder to shoulder, to help the victim of a shameless aggression. I greet you, Mr. President, and in your name, the whole French nation. We can both be confident in the justice of our cause and convinced that our joint efforts and sacrifice will triumph as they triumphed the quarter of a century ago over the forces of destruction. His Majesty the King and the President of the Polish Republic have today exchanged a telegram. The Polish President expressed the feelings of friendship and loyalty of the whole Polish people towards the British nation, and His Majesty replied, Both I and my people are proud to stand beside you in your just and valiant resistance to a shameless aggression, and I have unshaken confidence that right will prevail. Here is the latest news of the fighting in Poland. An official communique issued in Warsaw today reports a number of successful counter-attacks by the Poles against the Germans. The communique states that the positions were unchanged after heavy fighting on the East Prussian frontier and that the small Polish garrison at Westerplatte in the Danzig area is still holding out. It is also officially claimed in Warsaw that during severe fighting, Polish airmen attacked a large enemy land force and broke up two columns of tanks. War communiques announced on the German wireless claim that in the northern sector, Pomeranian units have reached the Vistula and that Polish forces in the north of Pomorze have been cut off. <coughs> German advances in the Silesian or southern sector are also claimed, one of them south of the industrial area near Krakow. Earlier this morning, the German wireless announced the capture of the Silesian town of Tarnowitz. It is also claimed that two Polish submarines and one destroyer have been sunk. The Polish government has issued a proclamation urging all former citizens of Czechoslovakia to take up arms against their hereditary enemy, Germany. The proclamation urges Czechoslovaks still under the domination of the swastika to sabotage the German war machine. A Czech legion numbering 25,000 men is being formed in Poland by General Prakala. It is reported that the first Czechoslovak units are already under fire. Citizens of the former Republic of Czechoslovakia 
will not be treated as enemy aliens. A decree issued today by Field Marshal Goering prescribes heavy prison sentences for persons found guilty of sabotage of goods or equipment of national necessity. News of the decree was announced over the German wireless. The German liner Columbus has taken refuge in Vera Cruz Harbor. There are now nine German passenger and cargo vessels interned in Mexico. In a broadcast to the Polish nation last night, Colonel Beck, the foreign minister, said that Poland, in fighting against invasion, had the sympathy of the whole civilized world. Nobody honestly weighing the facts can doubt who is the aggressor. <clears throat> and what are the motives guiding each of the two countries at war, said Colonel Beck. <clears throat> Dr. Benish, the former president of Czechoslovakia, in a telegram to Mr. Chamberlain, says, We Czechoslovak citizens consider ourselves to be also at war with the German military forces. And we shall march with your people until the final victory and the liberation of the fatherland. King Leopold of the Belgians, who has assumed command of the Belgian army, broadcast at 8.30 tonight. And a report of his words will be given in our later bulletins. In the South African House of Assembly today, the Prime Minister, General Herzog, read a declaration of policy. It was that South Africa's relations with the various belligerent countries in the present European conflict should persist unchanged. Existing obligations should continue unimpaired. For instance, the British naval base at Simonstown should remain. General Herzog went on to say that a difference had arisen in the cabinet on the question of this policy. General Smuts moved an amendment calling for a severance of relations with Germany and continued cooperation with the British government. General Smuts said that if they followed the course proposed by the Prime Minister, they would in the end still be forced to take sides one way or another. If they parted from the Empire on this, when the day of trouble came, when the German demand for the return of Southwest Africa was made at the point of the bayonet, they would stand alone. In the South African House of Assembly today, the Senate bill passed all its stages. The bill enables a new Senate to be constituted while the old one still exists. And a careful study has been made to see how far the government can operate without amending the Neutrality Act. In the United States last night, President Roosevelt broadcast a declaration that the United States will be neutral but that in the world of today, no country could remain unaffected by war. Even a neutral had the right to take account of facts. Even a neutral could not be asked to close his mind or his conscience. Here is a message that's just come in. An official war communique issued in Paris tonight says, Contacts have been progressively made on the front. French naval forces have taken up positions assigned to them. Aerial forces are proceeding with a necessary reconnaissance. Another later message. According to a Polish news agency, dispatch. The village of Chirinluch near Tarnow in South Poland was destroyed by incendiary bombs today. Many people are said to have been killed in the raid. The Havas correspondent in Warsaw reports the German planes bombed the city at four o'clock this afternoon. It is reported that several fires broke out. The Berlin Wireless admits that British planes succeeded in dropping leaflets over Germany last night. A 
Although confirmation has not yet been received in London, it is reported from Tokyo that the Japanese government has declared its intention to remain neutral in the present conflict. Pan American Airways have cancelled flights to Marseilles and Southampton. The service to Foynes and Lisbon will be continued. Sir Thomas Inskip, the new Lord Chancellor, has had to cancel his intended visit this month to Newfoundland. Before the recent government changes, Sir Thomas is Secretary of State for the Dominions. Here at home, the National Registration Bill, which passed his second reading in the House of Commons today, provides for the issue of an identity card to every person in the United Kingdom, with the exception of the armed forces. Sir John Anderson's first task in Parliament as the new Home Secretary and Minister for Home Defence was to announce that all Germans and Austrians in this country will be examined immediately. Examiners will sit in London and the provinces to decide who shall be interned or otherwise restricted. He said that all aliens who might be hostile to this country must be rendered harmless. And he revealed that a number of aliens whose activities were suspicious are already detained. All enemy aliens over 16 and British-born women who became German or Austrian by marriage must now report to the police. Citizens of the former Czechoslovak Republic will not be treated as enemy aliens. The German chartered affair in London left Gravesend tonight for Rotterdam with other members of the embassy staff. They were among a party of 120 Germans leaving this country. The British and French ambassadors to Germany, Sir Neville Henderson and Monsieur Coulondre, left Berlin at 9 o'clock this morning for Holland. According to the Berlin news agency, the German authorities had refused to allow them to travel by way of Belgium. A special train carrying the staff of the German embassy away from Paris is reported to be standing at the last French station before the Belgian frontier, waiting there until Monsieur Coulomb has left Germany. The former Polish ambassador in Berlin, with members of his staff, reached Copenhagen today. It is reported from there that the whole party had to wait in the train on German territory for two days, because two members of the staff had been detained at the frontier. The evacuation from London of children, expectant mothers and blind people was completed tonight. Mr. Herbert Morrison, chairman of the LCC Emergency Committee, said today that between last Friday morning and midnight on Sunday, nearly 600,000 adults and children were moved out of London without a single casualty. Lord Gort has been appointed Commander-in-Chief of the British Forces in the field. General Sir Edmund Ironside becomes Chief of Staff in his place. And General Sir Walter Kirk becomes Commander-in-Chief of the Home Forces. Lord Gort is only 53 and is an Irishman. He has been Chief of the Imperial General Staff since 1937. He was a captain when war broke out in 1914. His outstanding ability and courage won for him the Victoria Cross, the Military Cross, the DSO, and nine mentions and dispatches. General Sir, Sir Edmund Ironside, the new Chief of General Staff in place of Lord Gort, is 59 and has been a soldier for 40 years. He was recently Inspector General of the Overseas Forces. General Sir Walter Kirk, now Commander-in-Chief of the Home Forces, is best known as the organizer of the new Territorial Army. His Royal Highness, the Duke of Kent, who is a rear admiral, has taken up his naval war appointment. The Committee of the London Stock Exchange has decided that the house will remain closed until further notice. The settlement of accounts has been postponed. Pending the reopening of the house, minimum prices for certain securities have been fixed. All bargains must be for cash and may not be continued from day to day or otherwise. No new time bargains or options will be allowed except in connection with existing contracts and existing continuations. 
A proclamation concerning contraband of war was made at the Royal Exchange in the City of London today by the City Sword Bearer and Acting Common Crier. About 200 people, most of whom had gas masks slung over their shoulders, heard him cry, by the King, a proclamation specifying the articles to be treated as contraband of war. George R. I. The list covers arms and ammunition, fuel, fuel of all kinds, all means of communication and of transportation, including animals, coin, bullion, currency, evidence of debt, metal materials, food, forage, and clothing. Good evening. <clears throat> the British Air Force has gone into action. Late tonight, a communique was issued in London stating that a, a successful raid was carried out on the German naval ports of Wilhelmshaven and Brunsbüttel at the entrance to the Kiel Canal, and that direct hits were registered on at least one battleship. Earlier, we learned that, th th that last night, the RAF planes flew over northern and eastern Germany and dropped six million leaflets. It's Hitler's war. This sentence is taken from the headline of the leading editorial in the London Times this morning, and I believe that this war will go down in history as Hitler's war. Every first-class war has, has its distinctive name. There was the Great War, of course, now possibly to be eclipsed by a greater. There was the Thirty Years' War, and there were the Napoleonic Wars. This is Hitler's war, and whatever the result, Hitler will go down to history as its creator. Britain awoke to shocked horror today when the morning papers published a brief communique from the Admiralty announcing the torpedoing of the liner Athenia with 1,400 people, of whom, of whom 311 are Americans on board. By this act, Hitler's Navy has violated every rule of international law. The act of the submarine commander who launched that torpedo is one of pure piracy, and moreover, it violated one of the few clauses in the Anglo-German Naval Treaty which Hitler did not denounce a few months ago. Perhaps he will argue that in war, all treaties go by the board. But this clause was one which was intended only to apply in war. It forbade the sinking of merch merchant ships by submarines, without previous warning and without arrangements being made for the safety of the passenger and crew. The ship's boats were specifically excluded from the definition of safety arrangements, unless the vessel was less than an hour's pulling from the shore. The Athenia was about 200 miles out in the Atlantic. Some sense of shame perhaps remains to the Germans, for the Secretary of State in Berlin today is reported to have said that Germany's submarine commanders <coughs> had instructions to obey the rules and to have suggested that the Athenia must have been sunk by a floating mine. Maybe, but mines are not generally found that far out, and the Admiralty announces that no British mines have been laid in these waters. We shall have to await the arrival and era of the survivors and of the captain of the Athenia before we know exactly what happened. But in his wireless messages for help, the captain definitely said that he had been torpedoed. It's worth noting that Lord Moham, the famous Lord Chancellor, stated in the House of Lords this afternoon that 75% of the Athenia's 1,400 passengers were women and children. Now, I don't want to revive the baby-killing talk of the last war. I suppose in modern warfare, civilians sometimes must be killed. But humane nations and humane commanders try to avoid it and generally succeed. The Germans have not and don't. Europe thought that they'd been taught at least better manners, if not more humanity, by their defeat in 1918, but apparently it was mistaken. Another sentence much on men's lips today was Hitler's beginning where the Kaiser left off. That is true. It took Imperial Germany nearly a year to get round to the U-boat campaign, and then she was ashamed of it and justified it as a stern necessity. Today, the opening of a fresh U-boat campaign is one of our first acts of war. The first task which fell to Winston Churchill in his new job as First Lord of the Admiralty, or rather in the old Great War job to which he's returned, was to announce the Athenia crime to the House of Commons. He said that the Admiralty's reports indicated that there was absolutely no warning and, the, and that the attack was in direct contravention of all international law and of the rules to which Germany had given her perfectly free assent. He told how four destroyers had been dispatched to the scene immediately on receipt of the Athenia's SOS, and he promised that a complete convoy system for merchant vessels would be instituted without an instant's delay. In the Lords, both Lord Maum and both Lords Maum and Strabolgi, the latter a former naval officer, denounced the act as piracy. The Poles seem to be doing pretty well in holding the Germans. They've recovered some of the territory lost and some points have actually penetrated into Germany.
Of course, the Count hoped to stand up very long against the superior numbers of the German army, but they may be able to hold the enemy until British and French aid reaches them, either through assaults on Germany's western front or through naval action. Reports say that the Germans have taken a leaf out of the Russian Air Force book and are dropping military parachutists behind the Polish lines to blow up bridges and commit other acts of sabotage. In England, the process of tightening up the civil defense goes on. Sir John Anderson announces today that the roundup of dangerous enemy aliens in Britain has begun. He doesn't say how many have been arrested, nor does he say what's being done with them, but presumably they'll be placed in concentration camps as their predecessors were in the Great War. These aliens are all German and Austrian. Czechs are not treated as enemy aliens, and the distinction will be made, will be made also for genuine German and Austrian refugees fleeing from the Hitler regime. There are all told about 220 aliens, enemy and friendly in Britain. So far as we're allowed to see, this sort of thing is going on much more smoothly and efficiently than last time. The police, in fact, have never relaxed their vigilance over foreigners since it was imposed in 1914. It has been exercised with tact and courtesy, but it has been there all the time, so that when the hour came, they were able to pick up the suspects without fuss or trouble, and they have not disturbed the honest and friendly foreigner who only wants to be let alone. The king today sent messages of inspiration and confidence to his sailors, troops, and airmen, and is warmly thanked for them by the three ministers. The French have issued a communique, but it isn't very enlightening. It simply says that operations have begun by the land, sea, and air forces. Now, I'm fully aware of and in sympathy with the reasons for concealing military movements, but this complete fog is beginning to draw criticism from the British man in the street who thinks he's entitled to know if his forces are doing anything at all. Although the two air raid alarms yesterday proved to be without real foundation, they've had an excellent effect on the public morale. They've convinced the public that their air force is active and on the watch, and have also given it an opportunity of becoming acquainted with the air raid shelters, which aren't such bad places to spend an hour in after all. The no notable feature of these refuges was the good humor and helpfulness of everybody. In the hotels, most of which have elaborate shelters fitted up in their basements, servants and guests mingled as equals, and as most of them were in dressing gowns, or rather sketchy dress anyway, it was rather hard to tell the difference. In fact, many of the servants were for the time being in positions of authority and responsible for the orderly management of the refuges, and they didn't hesitate to exercise that authority for the good of all. What really happened in each case was that the strange plane was detected flying near the British coast. Fighters went up and in each case identified the plane as a friend. The public, therefore, is beginning to feel fully confident in the alertness of the air watchers. I've also been told today that the detection instruments in use are now so delicate that they can spot an approaching plane an enormous distance away and long before its identity can be established. The evacuation of London children and invalids is complete. In three days, Herbert Morrison, leader of the London County Council, announced today... Uh, in three days, Herbert Morrison, leader of the London County Council, announced today 600,000 persons were moved out of London, including 5,000 hospital patients, and there was not a single casualty. No such shift of population in such a short time is on record. The children are now established in country homes of all classes, from cottages to mansions. One lot of 11 children have 10 servants to wait on them in a mansion. Others are doubling up in cottage bedrooms and helping their hosts to do the work. In London today, it looked like a real bank holiday. The banks were closed, as announced, and some general business houses also put up their shutters for the day, and they were wise. There was hardly any shopping done in London. This morning I walked along Oxford Street, London's chief shopping centre, and it was almost deserted. I went into a couple of the biggest stores and hardly saw half a dozen customers in each. There was absolutely no business doing, and the stores would have been better closed. And there wasn't much to sell if there had been customers. Stocks in many lines have been depleted, and it's been difficult, owing to the country's concentration on war preparation, to get fresh supplies. One interesting shortage is that of portable radio sets. There's been a rush on them by people who have had to leave their homes temporarily. And today in London, there's hardly one to be had for love or money. The demand was chiefly for the small American type of set worked by battery. These were just unobtainable, and only a few electric wire sets were left. It was noticeable also that the few shoppers who were about all carried their gas masks slung over their shoulders, and most of the clerks in the shops had theirs either attached to their persons or handy on the counter. Hitler, of course, has promised not to use gas unless his enemies use it first. But as Chamberlain told Parliament yesterday, no word or pledge of his can ever be believed again. I wonder if the Germans realize today how their reputation as decent Europeans has suffered. 
One of the most inviolate tenets of international law is that the persons of an ambassador and his staff are sacred. In all former wars between civilized nations, the ambassadors of the warring nations have left their enemy capitals and made a show of personal friendliness and courtesy. There never was the slightest suspicion that they would not get out safely and without unpleasant incidents. Britain and France have always been particularly punctilious about this, but this time they felt compelled to take precautions. The train in which the German ambassador left Paris was guarded at each end by soldiers with fixed bayonets and was not allowed to cross the Belgian frontier until the news came that the French ambassador was safely out of Germany. Similar, the, similarly, the British waited to hear that Sir Neville Henderson was safe before allowing the German charges of fare to go tonight. Britain's no longer, uh, Germany is no longer treated by civilized nations as one of their group. She's looked on as an international gangster who can't be trusted out of sight of the police. One little incident in, uh, illustrates by comparison how low Germany has fallen in international esteem. The French today opened their frontier with Italy. Mussolini has promised to be neutral, and he's regarded as a man of his word. So much so that France takes a chance of allowing free traffic between herself and Italy, confident that her trust will not be abused. None of Germany's neighbors would do that today on the strength of Hitler's promises. Senior, which was sunk this morning by a German submarine, was torpedoed without warning at least 200 miles from land. All the passengers and crew, except those killed by the explosion, took to the boats and were picked up by various ships. The number of killed is not yet known. It's officially stated in London that this attack without warning is in direct contravention of the rules regarding submarine warfare. These rules which Germany has agreed to adhere lay down clearly that no merchant ship may be sunk without warning and that in any case no merchant ship is to be sunk until the safety of all passengers and crew has been assured. The rules further state that ships' boats are not to be considered in a place of safety unless they are within half an hour's rowing distance of land under favorable conditions. The Athenia, outward bound for Canada with 1,400 passengers, reported to the Admiralty at 4 o'clock this morning that she had been torpedoed and was sinking. Destroyers rushed at full speed to the scene to pick up survivors. 311 Americans, as well as many Canadians, were among the passengers. Mr. Stephen Early, President Roosevelt's secretary, has emphasized that the Athenia was outward bound, taking Americans and Canadians from the war zone. He pointed out that this showed there was no possibility that the ship was carrying any munitions or war material. The Athenia, which belonged to the Donaldson Atlantic Line, left Glasgow last Friday and Liverpool on Saturday afternoon, bound for Montreal with passengers and 1,000 tons of cargo. Canada, Australia and New Zealand have made it still clearer that they stand with Great Britain. And Australia and New Zealand have already announced that they, like this country, are at war. The Australian Prime Minister, Mr. Menzies, has sent the following cable to Mr. Chamberlain. Your broadcast has moved Australia deeply. We have proclaimed a state of war. I have broadcast on behalf of the government that we stand with Britain. We believe right to be on our side and victory to be sure. Mr. Menzies said that Australia was at war in a broadcast to the Commonwealth last night. Today, the Defence Minister, Brigadier G.A. Street, announced that no immediate call will be made for volunteers for active service. The Navy and Air Force have been mobilised and the militiamen have been called up for home defence. John Curtin, the leader of the Labour Party, has informed Mr. Menzies that the Labour Party will cooperate in the defence of Australia and the maintenance of the British Commonwealth to the greatest possible degree. The New Zealand government have sent a telegram informing the British government of their support and today the acting Prime Minister of New Zealand, Mr. Fraser, broadcast to the Dominion. 
He said that Germany's action left the British Commonwealth with no alternative but war, and he paid tribute to the peace efforts of the British government. Mr. Fraser declared that the people of New Zealand would throw themselves determinedly into any and every effort that might be required of them. Control has been established over New Zealand's factory production, oil, fuel, foodstuffs, electricity, mining, timber production, medical, dental and surgical supplies. In Canada, more than 100,000 men are already under arms and volunteers are thronging military depots to offer their services. There were scenes reminiscent of 1914 in Ottawa last night as thousands of people eagerly read the latest bulletins and sang patriotic songs. In a broadcast to the nation last night, Mr. Mackenzie King said the forces of evil had been loosed upon the world. Despite unceasing efforts to preserve the peace, the United Kingdom had become involved in a war. Canada, as a free nation of the British Commonwealth, would bring her effort into the war voluntarily. The Prime Minister announced that all the necessary measures for the defence of Canada and for cooperation with the United Kingdom would be placed before the Dominion Parliament next Thursday. He had no doubt the government's policy would be approved and he had already been given assurances by the leader of the opposition and of the other parties in Canada. Mackenzie King appealed to all the people of the Dominion for unity in the struggle ahead. A recording of his speech will be broadcast after the news at half past five Greenwich Mean Time this evening, 5.30. In all the British African colonies, the regular forces have been mobilised and all measures for security have been taken. In Egypt, precautions have been taken to ensure that enemy action shall not hinder the use of the Suez Canal by merchant shipping. The Egyptian Prime Minister has announced a cessation of relations with Germany. The German legation in Cairo have been handed their passports. In the United States last night, President Roosevelt broadcast a declaration that the United States will be neutral, but that in the world of today, no country could remain unaffected by war. Even a neutral had a right to take account of facts. Even a neutral could not be asked to close his mind or his conscience. The President announced that a proclamation of neutrality had been prepared. Rebroadcasting from stations in Australia, India and Ceylon is now permitted. They are also available for republication in Latin American countries only and for public audition on board all ships at sea. And now here is the news. The first grave news of the war was received here in London just under one hour ago. The British liner Athenia, with 1,400 passengers on board, has reported to the Admiralty that she has been torpedoed 200 miles west of the Hebrides. No further details have yet been issued. The Athenia is a vessel of over 13,000 tons <coughs> and belongs to the Donaldson Atlantic Line of Glasgow. Air raid warnings were sounded in the early hours of this morning over a wide area embracing London and parts of the Midland and Northeastern counties. The warning was heard at about 2.30 and by 4.15 a.m. all areas involved were reported all clear. Since Britain and France declared war on Germany yesterday morning, there have been three major developments. One, the setting up of a war cabinet in this country, two, the appointment of three British Army chiefs, and three, announcements that Australia and New Zealand have ranged themselves alongside the mother country. The war cabinet consists of nine members, with Mr Chamberlain as Prime Minister, and it includes Mr Winston Churchill, who is First Lord of the Admiralty, and Lord Hankey, who becomes a minister with our portfolio. 
There are a number of other new ministers not in the War Cabinet, including Mr. Anthony Eden, who becomes Dominion Secretary. Both His Majesty the King and Mr. Chamberlain broadcast to the people of the Empire yesterday. The King spoke last evening, and here is a recording of his words. The grave hour, and perhaps the most faithful in our history, I send to every household of my people, both at home and overseas, this message. It's spoken with the same depth of feeling for each one of you, as if I were able to cross your threshold and speak to you myself. For the second time in the lives of most of us, we are at war. Over and over again, we have tried to find a peaceful way out of the differences between ourselves and those who are now our enemies. But it has been in vain. We have been forced into a country where we are called with our allies to meet the challenge of a principle which, if it were to prevail, would be fatal to any civilized order in the world. It is the principle which permits a state in the selfish pursuit of power as the disregard is treated and its solemn pledges, which sanctions the use of force or threat of force against the sovereignty and independence of other states. Such a principle stripped of all disguise is surely the mere primitive doctrine that might is right. And if this principle were established throughout the world, the freedom of our own country and of the whole the British Commonwealth of Nations would be in danger. But far more than this, the peoples of the world would be kept in the bondage of fear. And all hopes of settled peace and of the security of justice and liberty among nations would be ended. This is the ultimate issue which confronts us. For the sake of all that we ourselves hold dear and of the world's order and peace, it is unthinkable that we should refuse to meet the challenge. It is that there is high purpose that I now call my people at home and my people across the sea who will make our call their own. I ask them to stand calm and firm and united in this time of trial. 
the task will be hard. There may be dark days ahead, and war can no longer be confined to the battlefield. But we can only do the light as we see the light, and reverently commit our call to God. If one and all we keep resolutely faithful to it, ready for whatever service or sacrifice it may demand, and then with God's help we shall prevail. May he bless and keep us all. We continue this news bulletin from London with the latest news of the fighting in Poland. The German attack on Poland appears to be concentrated mainly in three areas. The province of Pomerza, the corridor, is being attacked from Germany and from East Prussia. It is claimed that German armoured cars have reached the Vistula from East Prussia. The Polish communique issued last evening stated that Polish troops have recaptured the cities of Puk and Orlovo and that the Polish garrison at Westerplatte is still holding out. Further to the south, in the ravich Leslo sector, it is reported that Polish troops have crossed the German frontier and are fighting on German territory. They have also captured the frontier town of Zbain, which was occupied by the Germans in the first day of the war. In Upper Silesia, the second main area, there are reports of violent fighting, principally concentrated in the town of Czestochowa, about 15 miles from the frontier. Polish fighters engaged a German bombing squadron and shot down four planes. Later in the day, a Polish official communique said that Polish troops had been forced to abandon the town. Polish reports deal mainly with bombing attacks by German planes, and the Polish ambassador in London told newspaper representatives yesterday that German aeroplanes last night dropped gas bombs on Polish towns. In later reports, the towns of Kielce, Lodz, and Bydgosz are specifically mentioned. Five German bombers were brought down in an encounter over the city of Kalisch. In all, a total of 64 German raiders were brought down. A Warsaw message says that 1,500 people, including many women and children, were killed or injured in German air bombardments of open towns or villages in Poland in the first two days of the war. In Warsaw yesterday, thousands of Poles gathered before the British Embassy to demonstrate their enthusiasm for the Anglo-Polish War Alliance. The Polish Foreign Minister, Colonel Beck, appeared on the balcony with Sir Howard Kennard, the British Ambassador, and the crowd cheered warmly when they shook hands. Colonel Beck, addressing the crowd, said, Citizens, in a moment of such historic importance, we feel deeply the brotherhood between us and the British nation. We shall fight until the victory is ours. Long live the King of England. The British ambassador then addressed the crowd with these words. Shoulder to shoulder, Poland and Britain will stand against aggression and injustice. Long live Poland. Long live the heroic Polish and British armies. It was reported from Berlin last night that Herr Hitler has left there for the Polish front. In Luxembourg, the inhabitants of the frontier district of Schengen were evacuated last evening. A Reuter message from Nice says that the Franco-Italian frontier was reopened yesterday. The frontier was closed against Italians wishing to enter France last week. Traffic at the frontier post of Pont-Saint-Louis, the message adds, was normal yesterday. 